Welcome everybody. Today's Open to Everyone webinar series is going to focus on the administrators out there and, um, and looking at the, the power that you have in Koha. So today we are going to cover all things administration within the Koha system. So thank you very much for joining me. And let me go ahead and do some swap around. My name is Kelly and I'll be taking you through this journey today and talking about all the things that um, there is that power in Koha to do. There we go. And I'm gonna be, I'm sharing my screen. Oops, sharing my screen. You should be able to see the Koha OPAC. Sorry, the Koha staff interface. So again, welcome. Um, it is just one o'clock, so we'll give it a we'll give it a shot and start this this up. But we are going to talk a lot about Koha administration. A lot of the administration um, that lives in Koha lives in the Koha administration module. Now that being said, we are going to pop over to the tools module just to show a few other things. But we're going to focus on the um, the beginning part of the Koha administration. So if you're new to Koha. Um, it's broken out by modules. It is permission based. So you're going to be able to see everything that a super librarian has, but this is not necessarily what powers all users have. Koha breaks out the Koha administration module into first the what's known as global system preferences. So this is going to control um, lots of different choices of turning things on and turning things off. Um, it kind of, there's probably 800 of those that, that work within Koha. And the beauty of, of it is you truly can turn something on and turn something off through these global system preferences. So let's pop over there first. Hopefully, uh, Koha has broken that out on the left-hand side into modules. We're a little bit more um, specific than the modules within Koha. So you can see over here on the left, we have acquisitions, then they break it out into subcategories and how that is broken out over into the right. So that's edifact, then there's policy, and then there's printing, so on and so forth. We'll pop over to cataloging. We're going to have a, a couple more, you know, talking about just the interface on Koha and what we should turn on and what we should turn off. As I said before, there are things like you know, record structure, how are our barcodes formatted within the system? So that's really helpful. If you are needing to have Koha create barcodes for you, you have a couple of different choices. You can see I have them in number form. I can do them by branch code. I can do them by EAN 13 digit barcodes um, and a couple other varieties, or you can say, no, Koha, don't create those barcodes for me. I've already bought some barcode sheets and I'm able to scan those in. Um, another great one is that item call number. Again, this is has so much flexibility to say, hey, wouldn't it be great if when I pull in a record, it's going to look in a specific mark subfield and populate my item call number from my mark record. So I'm setting it up that I'm going to pull in my Dewey number from that 082AB. That's really helpful. I can add more if I wanted to, and it would go incrementally down. Now, if we pop into circulation, you can see it gets quite lengthy here. And the great part about um, a migration to Koha is you're gonna go through these system preferences in a different kind of format. You may talk about your workflows and that would identify maybe some finds policies that you have. And those system preferences could be set up according to your workflows. Later on during your migration, we may look at other areas that you may want to customize your OPAC and the features and functionality that the OPAC has. So it's kind of a work in progress. And of course, once you go live with Koha, you can turn things on and off afterwards or say, hey, wouldn't it be great if we started to use this feature that we didn't think we would use, but now it seems like a great idea. For example, um, when lost, charge a replacement fee. Do you want to charge a replacement fee or don't you want to charge a replacement um, fee when something has been marked lost? 
Once an item in these global system preferences have been saved, you would need to just make sure that you update it, save those, and then that's going to actually be pushed out. So it's really actually pretty fantastic, the ability and customization that you have. Now you can see my circulation goes pretty far into even including a self-checkout module. So Koha does have a self-checkout module within the system. You can set this up and then this is actually going to give you, scroll down a bit, this is actually going to give you the URL of the self-checkout um, module and then you're going to push that out into a maybe separate computer within your system and have users be able to check things out. So once you turn that on, you can you can have it go. There are quite a few preferences that you can um, pick and choose again through that process. Another thing that comes to mind is that self-registration. There's a lot of choices in that process, and that would allow you to be able to identify and uh, make those changes. That would probably go under the OPAC. So you can see the OPAC gets pretty large. There's your self-registration, and you can, um, as I said, turn things on or turn things off. You can set that to allow, and then choose your um, mandatory fields. Choose the fields that you don't want somebody to um, fill in. Choose to have them confirm by email. What patron category will they be set up? So the list can go on and on truly with those system preferences. A real nice advantage through the process is you have this help button. The help button is not a good help button there. The help button through the help option here it's going to bring you to the manual and specifically to the administration where we just were. So it's going to break out what you're looking at on your Koha screen in the manual. It opens up in a new tab and you're able to browse and be able to see screenshots and step-by-step -step explanations on what you're seeing on the Koha staff interface. Pop back over, it did open in a new tab. So let me close those up for you. So that's your global system preferences. Now, of course, you can, I'm going to type in lost, you can search your global system preferences for more than one word, a single word, and it's going to populate all those system preferences that come along with it. So you can see just looking at loss, because we know that's a big area in some libraries, look at all the um, system preferences that have the word lost and the different configurations that you can do with that. I'm, I'm never, never a good remember of the system preference names. I usually go with kind of a default word I know that should be there. Under the basic parameters, it's good to know that under libraries is where all your library information is going to be stored. So the name, the name that shows up here, the name that's going to show in your notices and slips, the name that's going to show on your OPAC, this is the name. Now, through Koha, there are a lot of codes, and those are going to be used in the database. So I'm able to see the code of my branch but that's not necessary to my day-to-day -day experience within Koha. Let's go ahead and edit one of these, maybe the East branch. Filling out this information is going to populate, again, as I said, notices and slips, that email, any information that I'm storing, as well as it could be reflected in the OPAC when a user sees your branch they can actually see information. So I have this something really silly here. When you look at an item within the OPAC and you hover on that branch, you're gonna see this and then you're gonna see our hours. So something super fun. A few other things that you can do in the library branch itself, you can put in your MARC organizational code. So for all those tech services folks out there um, that can pre-populate into your cataloging records, you can make this a pickup location or not. So for those libraries using maybe a tech services branch or um, a bookmobile, you can opt to make that something like, no, I don't actually want somebody to be able to pick up from this. There's that much customization there. There is no additional fee or charges when you create a new library within the system. You can just start a new library and um, go from there. So there's a little bit of fun when you think about if you want to maybe do a bookmobile or I know there's a 
um, one of our partner libraries that has a bike mobile, which is pretty cool. Instead of going back to that main page, I'm gonna head over to library groups. And within the library groups, you can actually utilize the branches within your system or your libraries within your system and group them together. Um, I'm part of a, I was prior to Bywater, I was part of a 63 library consortium and there were definitely groups within there, whether they're sharing with those, they're, um, they're resource sharing and they actually want to be able to create hold um, rules for those hold groups. So you can see a couple of the features that you can do when you group together libraries is you can hide patron information from outside this group. You can create a search group within the OPAC, allowing your users to search just within that group. You can create one for staff. And again, for those holds, those specific local hold groups that you want to create. So there's a great deal of flexibility with library groups. It's kind of a newish feature within the system and it's um, it's growing quite strong and a lot of new enhancements are growing with it. So it's really exciting to see that expand. Item types. Now, if you are unfamiliar with um, Koha's item types, it's more like a material type from other ILSs. So you have audiobooks, DVDs, Blu-rays, and from there you can really reach out and make rules and um, default things that go along with those item types. Item types also drive your circulation in Koha. So when you think about creating a new item type or thinking about migrating to Koha, you can really say, hey, we'd like to you know, make some changes because we could group some of our material types together because they circulate the same and it would be really helpful to minimize what your users see. Of course, you can expand as well. You can see I have audiobook, Blu-ray, some grab bags, interlibrary loan, large print. Let's pop into Miss my DVD. You can see I had a image with it. I can search an image. I can create a description. So of course, DVD, DVD, but you could make a description that's really helpful to your users choose an icon, and then you have lots of choices when you're setting up those item types, whether it's not something you're going to see on the, the OPAC, whether it's not even for loan, if there's rental charges, um, if you have a default replacement cost. So something we looked at in the system preferences is if you wanted to charge a replacement cost. This gives you the ability right here to say, all my DVDs are $20. Now, say you bought that special edition Cinderella out of the vault and it was $100. You could individually price that Cinderella DVD at $100, but most of your other DVDs are $20. So again, you can get pretty specific whether this specific item is $100 and then the rest are $20. Saves you some time when cataloging. You can also um, apply a processing fee. You can create a check-in message. So for my DVD, I may choose a check-in message that says, count the CDs. And then with every DVD that gets checked in, that message will pop up, which could be super helpful. Now for those library um, consortiums or a library that has lots of branches, you can make a limitation for this item type. So you could say this item type is only used by a specific branch or these specific branches, which really helps for the other libraries that they don't see that when they're cataloging or searching within the system if you don't share material. So this allows for really customization for those multi-branch systems. You're going to see that happen a lot within Koha is that branch limitation itself. Authorized values are huge in Koha. That's where you're going to see every drop down menu is going to be controlled in the authorized values. So when you're going through and you have locations and collection codes and loss values, all of those are driven by an authorized value which also allows you to add and edit and delete values that you see in that drop-down menu. So let's pop over to our collection code. So these are collection codes that we've created where it's another level of 
organization of my material in my library where it says, hey, it's not necessarily living together on the shelf, but I count this as a collection. Now we have a code that gets associated with that. Codes in Koha, again, remember I said without those branch, we're not gonna really see them a lot when we're using the system, but when we're setting it up, we need to assign a code, 10 digits or less, no special characters or spaces. But then we can go further and create a description for both the staff side and alternatively the OPAC if we wanted to have it, something in the staff side, however, something to see by the um, patrons on our OPAC. Again, there's your library limitation, allowing you to again assign this to a specific library or a group of libraries that are using the collection code beginning beginner reader where maybe other libraries aren't. You can absolutely create more options for that collection code and all the other authorized values within the system. You can see we get pretty lengthy. I think there's yeah, there's 53. You have, let's look in your not for loan options. Here in our not for loan, we actually have numerical values in our authorized value. These numer numeric values are going to control whether something that's not for loan or hold are holdable or not. If something is with a negative value, that can be placed on hold. If it is something of a positive value, that cannot be placed on hold. So if you are going ahead and creating another value, maybe you needed to add a um, in binding um, bindery, and you didn't want that to be placed on hold when you created a new value right here, you would do that as a positive value and probably you would go with three would be your next choice. Again, you can see description, your OPAC description, and that library option of limit limiting your options there. So throughout Koha, you will find many drop-down menus, and now you know they're all driven by this option in the administration mo module called authorized values. That is going to be zero is available. Zero is, that's available. It's just built in. So not for loan. If it's nothing, it's going to be available. Good question. Okay, moving on to patron categories. Absolutely. Patron categories are also going to play a part in your circulation and fine rules. So you can identify a specific patron category and item type and tell Koha how long they can circulate something for. You can be as specific as my library staff can only check out five books or my library staff can check out 99 DVDs for this period of time. Library category, patron categories also are very specific in how long their library membership is good for, if they pay a fee, and it gets more specific than that. So let's pop in there. This grid is nice, but sometimes I like to just edit it just so I can see everything. You're going to give it that description. Again, you can see the code there. And then that description is what I'm going to see throughout how long their membership is for. We have a password expiration. So I'm thinking about your staff or your, you know, students. Maybe you want their passwords to expire every 45 days. And again, this is patron category specific, which is really helpful um, to say, okay, only for these patron categories do I feel as though a password expiration is important. Um, so you can go ahead and do that. Next time they log in past that days, they're gonna get a little, hey, let's change your password. For those children, you can create how old they would need to be to have a card of that patron category. And at what point do they max out on that card and they move on to the next um, patron category, thinking of like your you know, young adult to adult or, or child to teen or teen to adult. And in the back end of Koha, there is what's known as a cron that can actually change the category from teen to adult or child to teen based on these limits, and we can set the cron and then they can do that in the system automatically for you. See, there's an enrollment fee. If you send this patron category a overdue notice, 
Um, if you have a library limitation um, for this patron category, again, if you were a branch system and you had a school, plus you were a community library, maybe you don't need student to be seen when making new patron reservation re patron registrations on the community library, but only on the school library. You also have category type. Now, pausing here just for a second, category type is actually going to integrate maybe that guarantor-guarantee relationship. So you can have an adult and then you can have a child and they can be linked. You also have one more linkage. You can have an organization and a profession and those can be linked. So you can have like law offices with lawyers or doctor's offices with doctors or schools with teachers. So you can have a school and then the professionals are going to be those linkage. Lots of other options here under the um, patron category for password change if they're allowed, if they need to create a strong password, um, whether you check um, previous checkouts. I always like that for your like housebound or ILO people. And then you can create a default messaging preference for this patron category, meaning every time a, what are we on, a non-resident um, patron is created in the system, they're going to have these messages default turned on. So that saves some clicks for your staff saying, hey, this is what we need to make sure. Of course, you can add more during that registration, or you can have your patrons do that through the OPAC and add and pull back on those messages. Okay, the circulation and fine rules. Whew. Every library can have their own circulation and fine rule um, matrix. So I'm gonna kind of scroll it a little bit slowly so you can see it kind of goes across the screen like this. Lots and lots and lots of options as we scroll across. You can pick your library and say, okay, for the East Branch, these are the rules they're going to follow. And then this is where Koha will go across and say, hey, this is the rule. Let's go back to our standard rules where we have. If all libraries follow the same set of rules, then you can set them up here, make it super easy. And Koha is going to read these rules down. So it's going to say, I always imagine the Plinko machine going and you're kind of plink, <laughs> putting that Plinko down and it's trying to figure out what rule it's going to follow. So you can see I have a library staff specific rule, but if a library staff came to the desk and had a book, Plinko would go through and go, huh, I don't find a specific rule. I'm hitting the all rule. So this is every patron category. And it would follow that all rule and say, okay, this library staff could have books for as many as they wanted for 14 days. So just imagine that Plinko rule as they go down. Then there are some default checkout policies, some default checkout hold policies, and there's some hold policies by item type. Note, Koha will read this entire page from these charts for the bottom a little bit higher, and then it's going to go down. And during your migration, we will really dig into this um, matrix and make sure that it's set up. And that's the best part about the testing process. When you have your data in a test site, you're able to play around and make sure that you've addressed all your circulation policies within your system. I'm going to pop back over to our my administration page and just kind of touch upon some of the other things that um, Koha has in the administration, and then we'll head over to tools. There are plugins that are different kind of um, enhancements and features that Koha has outside of the specific um, software that you can input, like you can load in. Those could be specific to maybe you were having um, PayPal pay through your OPAC. They're very vendor specific. Then as we scroll up to the top, we have some cataloging kind of how to set up your frameworks, matching rules, your library classification um, scheme, adding some item search fields. So this is kind of encompassing that cataloging view of your administration. You also in the administration can set up currencies if you're, you have more than one currency that you receive from, budgets and funds, and then setting up your edifact ordering. A few of the additional parameters that I really like 
You can add more Z39.50 targets if you do your copy cataloging through Z39.50. There's a great resource um, that you can find more Z39.50 targets and go ahead and add those into your system. All the tables that you see in Koha or the majority of the tables you see in Koha, you are actually able to configure and tell Koha what you wanna see in those tables. Maybe you don't need to see um, the data sessioned in your circulation module and you can remove that and hide that. So that's where that lives. Table settings are gonna go throughout each area of Koha and break that down for you. You also can determine audio alerts that you can have. You can create new audio alerts and you can create shortcuts within the cataloging from here as well. So you have lots of lots and lots of customization that comes with the Koha administration module specifically. And now we're gonna go over to the tools because I just wanna talk a little bit about notices and slips in that overdue process that is in Koha, which I feel is very overarching. Within the tools, lots of actions, lots of functionality that exists and depending on where in Koha, but this is where the, where the action happens in Koha. Within Koha's notices and slips, you are going to see all the notice that, notices that can be sent out through the system. And you can either make branch specific notices or have a default that all libraries use. And as, you, as we scroll down, you can see what it says when you send an email saying your library registration is going to expire or what the notice says when your hold is ready for pickup. So it's, you know, pretty amazing. All the notices that you can see Koha sends out. I can go ahead and edit that. And then I have different ways that this, this notice is sent out. You see, I have email, phone, if you're using a third party um, option, shout bomb, Itiva, talking tech. If you're sending things out through SMS, you can customize the notice because you want it short and sweet with that SMS. You can go ahead and create that notice specific to an SMS versus that email. So you can see my email is kind of long. It gives a lot of information because we're sending it via email and we are able to show us all the things that we want to say. But in an SMS, we really just want to say, hey, you have a book ready for pickup. So, you know, these can be customized by your library or as a con um, consortium itself. Let me hit cancel here. Oh, I should say one more thing. Let's go to the account expiration one. You can also create notices that are specific to a language. So if you had the need um, in your community to create language notices, you can go ahead and do that. So I have my um, Spanish one. I can go ahead, create that in that language, still using the message body options. And then there's also an option on the OPAC and in the patron record to opt into that um, foreign language option. Overdue notice status and triggers. This gives you the ability to say who gets overdue notices when they get it and what happens when they get it. So this again is could be branch specific or you can do it for all branches. And then this identifies first, second, and third notices when those get sent out in the notice. So back in the notices, what notice it's going to send. You have the ability to send that through email, SMS, and phone, or have it printed. And then also at any point during this process, you can have Koha restrict that patron. So this is where this area lives. So it's really great that Koha sends three overdue notices and that you can space those out by patron category, by transport type, and also if there is a need to restrict that patron. It's another system preference that says clear the restriction when the overdues have been returned. So lots of interaction between both the global system preferences and the other customizations throughout the system. Another couple options that we have under the tools, we can batch delete patrons. 
They can follow a specific criteria of if they haven't borrowed, if their expiration, if they haven't connected, meaning they haven't gone to their OPAC and done any interaction with COHA OPAC or through the staff um, coming to the library. You can certainly go ahead and delete patrons in bulk, which is pretty great. You can also mat, um, batch patron modify in bulk. Lots of options there. Um, batch extend due dates that came, as we all remember, in, in 2020 when everything was kind of closed down. This gives you the ability to say, hey, I want to extend all these due dates to a specific time period. And that can go by patron category. It can go by library. It can go from, hey, when is it due? Um, and then do they have a hard due date or is it the number of days? So that's pretty customizable. The great thing about um, Koha, it's open source. It's used by libraries all over the world, small libraries, specialized libraries, com community libraries, academic libraries, health libraries. And because of that, that's where a lot of the customization and options come from, because as a large consortium, they may want it one way, but a small library wants it another. So we're going to give that option to many ways, which I personally really like as I've you know worked in both size libraries is the ability to say, we don't really need all this. We just need this. And Koha has that ability to do that. Okay, well, we didn't have many questions, but we are at, you know, at 1.30. It is important to know that um, we are continuing these um, webinars into 2023. And I can go ahead and put a link into the chat for our next scheduled coming up in January. I want to thank everybody for coming. If I can find this. Oh, I know. Okay. Share this tab. You come to our page. We have our events listed on that main page. Let me scroll down a little bit. So our next um, webinar series starts in January. Explore the possibilities. And you're able to see, starting in January, we're going to have another webinar. So I'll put this link into the chat. And if there's no more questions... Thank you very much for coming and have a great day.